Well, uh, apparently it can. Uh, okay, well, welcome to session three. We're going to go over hypotheses and variables today. And I also want to uh, note that normally I don't take role in classes. Uh, I figure it's everybody's responsibility to be present to the course that they enrolled in. Uh, if this was an elementary school setting, I would have a different idea, but everyone here is over 18 and can certainly take responsibility for their own uh, academic conduct, actions, inactions. But in a class like this that's dependent on group participation for the project, I am cognizant of the need for consistent attendance and participation, particularly in the group breakout times. So I am going to begin uh, keeping attendance record. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, code that along with the, uh, with the rest of the marks, and I'll use that to, uh, to inform final grades as, uh, as just part of the package. Okay, so for, uh, this is our agenda for today. And um, just as a note, just a little bit of an administrative note, I've made some modifications to the R homework protocol. I've moved them so that the first one is due starting at session nine. So I pushed that down the calendar, and you'll see that on page six of the syllabus. I've made a new version of the syllabus available. And then I've also shuffled around the order of the R homeworks. Essentially, uh, the first and fifth stay in the same place, but there's a slightly different order to what's uh, involved in two, three, and four. So if you uh, would go ahead and download the new revision of those homeworks, that'll keep you on track. Yes, question. Sorry, I just wanted to confirm, is this the same changes from last week or are these, is this a new? Oh, did revised? I already mention this? Yeah, this is the same as last week. Okay, um, I just, uh, I don't think I had it on the screen, but okay. Yeah, so uh, if you've already done this, you don't have to do it again. Okay, so a uh, little bit of review of last week's content is uh, we talked about the uh, article critique, which is due, and uh, we're now moving on to assignment two, the hypothesis development and the variable selection. And um, I believe one group finalized their two pairs of variable selections and the other group uh, had one pair and needed to seek out that other pair and it's pretty important that that get finalized today so in our breakout sessions I'll give both groups time to work together uh, the group that hasn't yet identified that second variable I think my instruction was to go shopping through the list everybody come in with at least one idea for a pair that the group can then uh, review and make a selection and and then I'd like to uh, review your selection to make sure you're on a good track I don't want you barking up the wrong tree for the whole rest of the uh, assignments and then, of course, uh, for the for upon finishing and finding those two pairs of variables, uh, the other group can move on with <clears throat> hypothesis development and uh, uh, based on those variables, building the research question, and that'll advance you up through uh, assignment two. So again, assignment one is due today. Be sure to submit that before uh, midnight, and. Um, in our last session, we reviewed uh, ways of using knowledge to inform each other, uh, the purpose and structure of an IRB institutional review board, and we talked about ways of conducting literature reviews to inform the research question and how to search for some articles. And also we differentiated between uh, quantitative and qualitative and talked a little bit about uh, mixed methods is blending of the two and uh, the various levels of knowledge acquisition ranging from exploratory, we don't know anything about this population up through explanatory is having more information about. Yes, question. Oh, I can't read what is on the screen. It's illegible. It's illegible. Okay. Um, uh, how about this? Can you read that? Better. Yes. Okay. It's, better. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty probably... blurry. Really? 
okay, that's curious. Uh, the best I can tell you is open the PowerPoint and follow along on your own computer if it's not transmitting well. Uh, there's, there's not a whole lot I can do about uh, internet transmission other than to tell you, yeah, it can be less than perfect, but this is why I make the PowerPoints and all the videos available because we're going to do some videos today. And if they're not transmitting well, uh, they're only a few minutes each. And after class, you can just run them for yourself. No uh, reception problems there. Uh, any other questions or comments? That's important for you. I'm glad you're giving me the feedback. Okay. Um, so the remaining assignments are going to be based on the student survey that we uh, talked about and that uh, you already did some preliminary view of the code book looking at the variables involved. And of course, uh, assignment two is, uh, is the next item up. And this is a, a bit of a preliminary view of all this is you'll develop a statement the general problem or question that you're studying and why it's important, and this will be based on your variable selections. And uh, this is all in the uh, syllabus. You'll discuss the theoretical or conceptual framework for your study, the hypotheses and research questions that pertain to the two sets of variables that you've identified. Again, you can see the two variables that you're selecting are the root of this assignment. And then discuss the research design that you're considering, and of course, prepare a table detailing these five attributes of each of the four variables that you'll be working with. And next week, I will go through and show you how to populate this table. And you and your groups will then be qualified, uh, presumably during the breakout session, to complete and assemble that table, I would think. Uh, so I'll have plenty of details for you on that by next week. We'll go through these uh, uh, one attribute after another, and I'll give you a thorough explanation uh, so you'll be able to proceed with that. And we'll be uh, uh, laying out some of the uh, some of the definitions, some of the technical definitions uh, this week to prime you for uh, preparing that table. Yes, question. Yes, I'm trying to open the PowerPoint, so I wanted to know which session is this uh, corresponding to? Uh, well, so today it's PowerPoint for session four. Okay, so that would be hypothesis okay. and variables? Um, yes, I believe that's right. Let me uh, let me just quickly check. Right, so it should the title of the PowerPoint should be SWK 6402 Session 04 Hypothesis and Variables. Right, so I try to keep the names as as aligned with what's uh, in the syllabus as possible. Thank you. Uh, is is the image any clearer by now? No. Uh, all I can do is apologize. I can't fix the internet, but um, at least you can follow along with the narrative and the PowerPoint if you have it. I'm up to the eighth slide by now, but I'm sure you can find some of that. So our study problem, we want to note the scope and significance of the problem. And we want to describe concerns related to the problem. And the study problem provides the context for assembling the research question. What is it that we want to understand? And this, under, this is about the context or the history of the problem. So for example, suppose we're interested in uh, child welfare worker turnover. Uh, anytime employees are leaving and others are coming in, we're losing a lot. There's a lot of institutional experience, seniority, and as you know from jobs you've done, uh, the first few months of a job are probably the least effective. There's so much learning and you don't understand everything there is to know. But after you've got six months, a year under the belt, uh, the job is really yours and you've made it yours and you know what you can and can't do and you've made a good adaptation to it. So having uh, high attrition rates is bad for everyone <clears throat> in the organization and it's bad for those getting service from the organization because you're not getting your best people, uh, your best trained and experienced people providing the service. So scope and intensity of the problem. So if we find in the literature that 60% of public child welfare worker 
organizations in New York State experience high turnover, and child welfare worker turnover impacts the quality of service provision for the children and the family known to the child welfare system. So there's a problem. Uh, background of the problem within society is some theorists have highlighted the matter of the majority of child welfare workforce being female with consideration of how the poor work-life balance realities of child welfare workers impact women who are mothers and partners. Uh, very often women are uh, the primary caretakers of the children. And if they're split down the middle, uh, what kind of choice are you going to make for your own children or for for those that you're hired to tend to, and this can make for some complex splitting. Uh, not that men don't take care of women also, uh, not, excuse me, don't take care of their families and children also. That the responsibility is, is, can be very evenly spread. And then we have discussion of relevant federal and state policy or judicial decisions to address the problem. So what's been done to address this problem that's not such a secret. And we find that the literature tells us that in response to the issue of child welfare worker turnover, the federal government has instituted incentives for uh, prospective social workers to work in child welfare programs on completion of their BSW and MSW degrees, which skeptically leaves me scratching my head. Is this the best solution that you have, apparently there is something systemically problematic with this position or it wouldn't be leaking so many people. And by just infusing more people into it might solve the problem in the short run. But that's like saying I have a tire with a hole in it. The solution is pump more air into it. That's That'll do something for you, but it, you're not solving the problem. And so my thought is I would continue the literature search and see if somebody's come up with something better than just infusing more people into the problem. Uh, what is it that's, that's causing such attrition? And then we can come to how and in what ways has the problem related to profession of social work in addition to limiting quality of services to child and welfare clients. Again, when you have big turnover, you're not getting your most expert people in the field. Uh, what are the negative impacts in professions uh, of perceptions of the profession of social work? Once again, you're not putting your most qualified people there. It takes six months, a year to get really good at a job. And if people are leaving left and right and your caseworker keeps changing and they don't know your case and all the details that aren't included in the notes, even if they review all the case, uh, there's a discontinuity of service and it can leave a bad taste in people's mouths. Boy, social workers are pretty flighty people. They're just, you know, they're here today and gone tomorrow and no notice and this isn't funny. So there are some deeper impacts that can happen. So with that, let's uh, let's watch the first video. And again, if this is coming through in a muddled way, uh, the fortunate thing is the uh, the person who does these videos, uh, she she's uh, she's got a lot of words to her. And uh, if you can hear the words, that should take you through, even if the video, uh, even if the visual is a little bit compromised. But let me run one of the videos for just a few seconds and tell me if you're getting anything at all. So let's get this going. In the theoretical framework, you explain the theories that support your research. Okay, are you able to catch the video? Sounds okay, yes, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and complete. Okay, real good. These are a few minutes each, and uh, I think we have four of them today, so here we go. Showing that your work is grounded in established ideas. Stay tuned to learn how to write one. Hi, I'm Jessica from Scrubber, here to help you achieve your academic goals. The goal of a theoretical framework is to present and explain the theories and models that other researchers have already developed. There may be many different theories about your topic. So the theoretical framework also involves evaluating, selecting, and comparing the most relevant ones. Here are three steps to create a theoretical framework. Let's get right in. Step 1. Identify your key concepts. 
The first step is to pick out the key terms from your problem statement and research question, and clearly define these terms. Step 2. Evaluate and explain relevant theories. As you write the theoretical framework, aim to compare and critically evaluate the approaches that different authors have proposed. In this example here, we compare Thomason's definition of customer satisfaction with Saitomo and Bittner's. After discussing different models and theories, you establish the definitions that best fit your research and justify why this is the case. So in our case, we explained why we went for Thomason's definition, because it's the most relevant to the aims of the study. In more complex research projects, you might combine theories from different fields to build your own unique framework. Step 3. Show how your research fit in. Apart from discussing other people's theories, the theoretical framework should show how your own project will make use of these ideas. You might aim to do one or more of the following. Test whether a theory holds in a specific context. Use theory as a basis for interpreting your results, which is what our example did here. Critique or challenge a theory. Combine different theories in a new or unique way. In a thesis or dissertation, the theoretical framework is sometimes integrated into a literature review chapter. If you need help with writing your literature review, check out this playlist. But if your research involves dealing with a lot of complex theories, it's a good idea to include a separate theoretical framework chapter. There are no fixed rules for structuring a theoretical framework. The important thing is to create a clear, logical structure. If you're stuck, Try to draw on your research questions, structuring each section around a question or key concept. Watch this place next to learn more about writing a dissertation. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there. Okay, so a couple things, uh, a, a lot went by there. And um, she's speaking about what I would consider uh, substantially larger projects than what we're doing in this class, a thesis or a dissertation. This is a much more compressed project with a tighter focus. And so the whole idea of blending two theories together, just pass on that. One theory, one theoretical framework should be quite sufficient for this because all of the data is coming from one place with one set of intentions is to better understand the students and their work-life balance and so I'll, I'll just let you in on my thinking, which is no secret, uh, a theory that you're all already familiar with is systems theory, is the multiple aspects of people's lives, the biopsychosocial profile coming together in a cohesive way should provide you with a viable theoretical framework for what's going on in this, uh, in this research that you're going to be embarking on through the two pairs of variables, is looking at the relationship between what's going on with school, who the individual is, the various factors in their life, family, work balance, that sort of thing. So uh, I'll, I'll give you that guidance uh, to help clear up the cloud of what theoretical framework are we talking about. And I think if you base it in systems theory and bring in discussion uh, of systems theory, that should get you where you want to go. So questions about selecting theoretical framework. Okay. So again, the theoretical framework section helps the reader understand how you've conceptualized your study, that your work isn't arbitrary. It fits into a larger system of founded thinking. It provides a credible structure to what you're doing. Uh, for instance, uh, the... Uh, Going back to the child welfare worker turnover problem, uh, maybe this would be conceived as empowerment theory, which requires the critical assessment of the social and historical factors involved of disadvantaged people is turning a disadvantage into an advantage. And how might that be used to guide people through reforming their situation?
Now, from here, let's move on to something a little bit more concrete. Uh, we're going to move into hypothesis. And we've talked about hypothesis already. So I'm going to have you watch the hypothesis video, and then I'll show you a concrete example of how we derive a relevant research question, and then the two corresponding hypotheses, the null and the alternate hypothesis. This is going to be really clear. But let's see what she has to say about all this first. I'm sure you've heard of the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Have you ever wondered if it's true? To test this, we have to formulate a proper hypothesis first. But what is a hypothesis? Hi, I'm Jessica from Scribber, here to help you achieve your academic goals. So, what's a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a tentative statement saying what you expect to find in your research. It's not just a random guess, but a prediction based on existing knowledge. Now we'll grab an apple and munch on it while we dive into this topic. Here are six steps to formulate a strong hypothesis. Step one, ask a question. Writing a hypothesis begins with a research question that you want to answer. The question should be focused, specific, and researchable. Here I have a question. What are the health benefits of eating an apple a day? Step two, do some preliminary research. Your initial answer to the question should be based on what is already known about the topic. Look for theories and previous studies to help you form an educated assumption. For example, you found that apples are nutritious. They're high in vitamin C that can boost your immune system. These are the health benefits that might contribute to fewer doctor's visits. Step three, formulate your hypothesis. After you've done your research, write down your initial answer to the question in a clear and concise sentence. For example, daily apple consumption leads to fewer doctor's visits. Step four, refine your hypothesis. In this step, you have to make sure the hypothesis is specific and testable. It should also contain the relevant variables, the predicted outcome of the experiment or analysis, and the specific group being studied. So let's set our target group to people who are over 60 years old. Step five, phrase your hypothesis in three ways. First, we have the if-then form. If people over 60s consume an apple daily, then they will visit the doctor less frequently. The first part of the sentence, daily apple consumption, states the independent variable, which is the cost. The second part states the dependent variable, frequency of doctor's visits, which is the effect. The second way is to phrase the hypothesis in terms of a correlation or effect. For example, Daily apple consumption in over 60s will result in a decreased frequency of doctor's visits. The third way of phrasing a hypothesis is by comparing two groups. People over 60s who consume an apple daily visit the doctor less frequently than those who don't. Step 6. Write a null hypothesis. Now, if your research involves statistical hypothesis testing, you also need to write a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis assumes there's no effect between the variables. In this case, the null hypothesis is daily apple consumption in over 60s will have no effect on the frequency of doctor's visits. If you want to see more examples on how to formulate a hypothesis, check out the article in the description. And that's it on how to write a hypothesis. If you've learned something, give this video a like, and if you have any question, ask away and I will reply. See you in the next video. Okay, so that's a lot and it went by real fast. Let me slow things down uh, and simplify things. So the hypothesis is based on the research question and the, and the theoretical framework. And basically, we start with our research question. Maybe our research question is, does a peer mentoring program, does peer mentoring help MSW students enhance their grade? That's the big research question. So we start there. That's what we want to know. And presumably, we have data on students who did and didn't participate in their, uh, in their MSW program with and without a mentor. So we're depending on those variables to be there. And this is the research question that's built on it. And just to give a little bit of backstory, suppose we uh, have randomly assigned uh, half of the MSW students to get a peer mentor. Uh, 
that they'll meet with and talk with once or twice a week. And the other group of students doesn't get the peer mentor. And we're going to look at their grades, their GPA at the end of the semester, and we'll make a comparison. So that's the research structure. And we'll get the data later. So our research question is, does having a peer mentor help MSW students enhance their grades? From there, we build the hypotheses and we start with the hypotheses that are going to be the answers, the two possible answers to this question. And we do this before we run the study. So we start with the null hypothesis and the null basically indicates that no, the treatment had a null effect. It didn't work. And so our null hypothesis denoted by H sub O says having a peer mentor does not enhance GPA. It, it didn't work. So this is the first possible answer to the research question. This, what would be the second possible answer to the research question? Okay, the alternative hypothesis is the alternative to the research question that says having a peer mentor does enhance grades. So now we have both heads and tails of the coin that's going to ultimately land. Once we've run our statistics, one of these hypotheses will come true. So we start with the research question based on our experiment, our data that we have on hand. We can build a meaningful research question then, before we go any further, we provide both possible answers. The null hypothesis, no, it doesn't work. Or the alternate hypothesis is yes, it does work. And then after we run our numbers, we run the statistics, we can revisit these hypotheses and identify which one of them actually came true. And then we can have some further discussion about the answer to the research question. This makes sense. Okay, there's slightly different variations depending on the kinds of variables involved, but essentially this is what we're looking for. The null hypothesis is essentially answering the research question, no. The alternate hypothesis is answering the research question, yes. No, it didn't work is the null hypothesis. The, the treatment had a null effect on people. The alternate hypothesis is, is alternative to the null. Uh, yes, it did work, it did help. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, kinds of data. The data I collect can be one of two things. It could be categories or it could be numbers. Categorical data, or qualitative data, is data where it might be red, green, blue, or Ford, Holden, Toyota, categories. Numerical data, or quantitative data, is where there's a number involved. There were 17 cars, there were five people. The height was 6.7 metres, the length was numbers. We can divide each of these kinds of data another step. Let's start with categorical data. Nominal data is data where the categories are just named. Nominal means names. Red, green, blue. Apples, oranges, bananas, kiwi fruit. Ordinal is where there's categories but there's some kind of order. Big, medium, small. Best, preferred, acceptable, maybe, no way. Although they're categories, there's an implied order to them. Both of these kinds of data are in categories. Nominal is when they're just named. Ordinal is when there's some kind of implied order. Numerical data we also break up into two kinds. Discrete data is where only particular values are allowed, usually only whole numbers, like how many cars or number of children. Continuous data is where any value in range is allowed. Mass of the cars, children's heights, any numeric value is possible, so that's continuous. There are sometimes tricky cases. Take shoe sizes, for example. 
Although I can have four, four and a half, five, five and a half, and so on, although I can have halves, I can't have other fractions. I can't talk about a shoe size of 5.1473. So only particular values are allowed. That's discrete. But if I measure the actual length of the shoe, that's going to be continuous, because it's going to be a precise number of millimetres or whatever. Even two shoes of the same size will have different lengths. Okay, so I'm going to simplify that just a bit. Uh, we're going to split this down to two types of variables here, categorical and continuous. So categorical is there's a list of categories, like check boxes, and continuous is basically a numeric variable. So let's take a look at some examples, because learning happens through examples. We'll start with continuous variables. These are numeric variables. These are the kinds of variables that you've been coping with your whole life. Anytime you've taken an algebra class, you've been working with continuous variables. These are variables. These are any number that you could punch into a calculator. It's simple numbers. So for instance, uh, we call this continuous because the numbers continue infinitely in the negative and positive directions along a number line. They just continue. They start at zero and they march to the right all the way to positive infinity. And then they also continue to the left, getting more and more negative. So the numeric values, these are called continuous variables. And an example could be age would be a continuous variable because it could be uh, someone who's 16 or 33 or so on. It's just a regular number, or it could be their GPA. So it could be a fraction, or it could be their height in inches or centimeters or whatever you want to measure it. It's just going to produce a regular number. Any questions about what a continuous variable is? It's just the kinds of regular variables you've been dealing with always. Any questions on a continuous variable? Okay, the other kind of variable that we're going to concern ourselves with is categorical variables. And instead of returning a number, it returns a category, a, num a, 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 a value in terms of the member of that category. In other words, you're looking for a list. So gender is the variable. And this is a categorical variable because it doesn't produce a number. I can't say that person over there, well, that's a one. And that person over there, that's a two. No, if we want to talk about their gender, we're talking about a list of categories. This is female, male, transgender, and whatever all else the list goes to. So it's still a variable, but it doesn't provide a number. It gives us a category. Any questions on the categorical variable? Here's another one. Handedness is the variable. And I can't say I'm a number one. It's like, no, I would say I'm right-handed or you're left-handed or you're ambidextrous. So the variable's there, but it doesn't get fulfilled with a number. There's a short list or maybe a long list of options you don't get a number, you get a category. Or it could be something as simple as voter status. And uh, either they voted in the last election or they did not vote. So voter status is the variable. And then there's two choices. So there's the difference between a, a numeric or a continuous variable, which is a number, and a categorical variable, <clears throat> which is like making a selection off a checkbox list. Questions about these two different types of variables. Okay, this is critical. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, what I was wondering is because last week we had mentioned uh, one of the set of questions we did was the degree of emotional support that a student has, and we were relating it um, to the age group uh, for the student, because that would actually be categoric, uh, categorical then rather than numerical because there's not actual, 
There's not a number of things saying, okay, you receive a four for emotional support. You receive a two, that type of thing. So it's not going to be with the numerical uh, quantitative, but it'd be the categor uh, categorical uh, qualitative instead. Right. So, uh, and, and I'm going to show an example of that in a little bit. So if I say, what is your age? And you answer that with a number, then that's a continuous variable. But if I say, are you 65 or older? That's going to be a yes or no question. And now we're categorical for age. Or if I put up a list of categories of age, what is your age? And option one is one to 18 Number two is 18 to 64, and the third is 65 or older. <clears throat> now age is categorical, right? That makes sense? Okay. Now, knowing what kind of variable you have on hand, continuous or categorical, is the first critical ingredient in selecting the appropriate statistic to process that pair of variables. So you need to be able to identify, do I have a continuous or categorical for the first variable? Do I have a continuous or categorical for the second variable? And those are the primary ingredients to making the right decision of what statistic you should reach for. So this is a critical concept that you've got to hold on tight to. It's not going away for this course. So with that, let's play nobody's favorite game, name that variable. I'm going to put up variables one by one, and I want you to tell me, is this categorical or continuous? And I'll, I'll tell you if you're right or wrong, and then I want you to give me a little bit of rationale of how you made that decision. <clears throat> so let's start with somebody's IQ score. Is this a categorical or a continuous variable, their IQ? That's going to be Just a go ahead and answer. It's absolutely going to be a continuous, correct. And how do you know that? It's strictly a number. We're not asking for a category, what group it's in. It's just what correct. is the actual number? We're asking for the number, not are you genius? Okay, here's another one. Marital status, continuous or categorical? Categorical. Categorical. Categorical, absolutely. And how do you know that's categorical? What would some of the items on the checklist be for marital status? It wouldn't be a number and it wouldn't be sort of a spectrum, right? It would be single, married, divorced, widowed, whatever that may be. Um, so it's going to be a, a qualitative right. result and, and there's no scale. Right. So it's, it's going to be a category, you know, married, divorced, separated, annoyed, whatever, uh, it's going to be a list, not a number. So that's categorical. How about this one? Amount of cash in your wallet or purse, continuous or categorical? Continuous. Continuous, absolutely, because it's going to be some numerical amount of how many dollars and cents do you have on you? Uh, how about this one? Political party affiliation. Categorical. Categorical. Categorical, right, because there's a short list of parties. You have Republican, Democrat, Green, Libertarian, Independent. It makes a list. Good. We're on track. How about this? Employment status. Categorical. Categorical, absolutely. Uh, and, and what would some of the options be on the employment status list? Employed, unemployed, full-time, part-time, per diem, I don't know. Underemployed. Absolutely. Underemployed, absolutely. Now, what if I asked number of hours worked per week, continuous or categorical? Continuous. Yeah. Continuous, exactly. And then zero would reflect either vacation or unemployed, right? So we'd actually get better information if we asked number of hours worked per week. Okay, how about this one? <laughs> oh, well, okay, hours worked per week. Uh, well, we just answered that one. It, continuous, right. And you can see that you're getting more precise answer as you reach for a continuous variable. So when you can, go for continuous, as opposed to saying, are you over 18, yes or no? Uh, better to ask, what's the age? We could do a lot more with a variable like that. 
How about citizen or citizenship status? Continuous or categorical? Categorical. Categorical, categorical right. Exactly, because they're they're citizen, they're not citizen, they're uh, applied for citizenship, they're green cards, whatever the list is. How about this pet owner, continuous or categorical? Categorical. Categorical, because either they do or don't own a pet. Sometimes it's just a yay or nay kind of question. Uh, daily emails, uh, specifically the number of emails someone's receiving per day. Continuous. Continuous. Ab absolutely. Continuous. It's going to be some kind of thing we can count. Uh, hours of sleep. Continuous. Continuous. Exactly. You guys are catching on beautifully. Here's another one. Mood measured on a one to five scale. One is a bad mood. Up to five is a good mood. Continuous or categorical? Continuous. Continuous, absolutely. It's going to produce a number. Now, to wrap it up, how about this one? Mood, bad or good? Categorical. Categorical. Definitely categorical. So the way the question and the answers are phrased, both the last two are going after mood, but one is picking it up off of the scale. The other one is giving you a couple of check boxes. Okay, really good. It's like closed and open you... then questions. Uh, yeah, a little that's, bit. that's another way. Yeah, it's, it's mm, I, I, these can all be kind of thought of as closed-ended questions. Uh, if you're giving check boxes, that's kind of closed-ended, and if you're just asking for a number, that's kind of closed-ended. But if it would be something like, um, "Tell me about your mood," that would be uh, that would be more of an open-ended question, and. At some point, we'd have to rank that, and we could decide if we're going to reduce that to a continuous or categorical variable. But we're not going to go that way in this class. We're going to stick with uh, strictly uh, quantitative variables. Okay, so with that, now that you've got continuous and categorical nailed down, uh, let's take a look at this last video on – uh, uh, we got some noise, if wherever that noise is coming from, please mute. Thank you. And uh, let's take a look at our fourth video today, uh, independent and dependent variables. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll give a, a more explanation on this uh, after the video. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to High School Science 101. Today, I am re-recording the first video that I uploaded because it was pretty low quality and I wasn't really happy with it. So this is in high definition. We're covering our three main variables in science which are our independent, dependent, and controlled variables. Let's get started. To explain these variables, there's a very simple experiment I like to demonstrate. Firstly, let's say that this is a running track, and we have our runner here, and he's going to run 100 meters. But each time he runs it, he's going to wear a different type of shoe. So we've got runners, casual shoes, and boots. And this is the thing that's going to change each time he runs this 100 meters. And this is called our independent variable. That's the thing that we're going to change each time he runs this experiment. So let's put his runners on first. We start the timer. He runs his 100 meters. We stop the timer and he got a time of 27.3 seconds. And this is the thing that we're measuring. The thing that we're measuring in the experiment is called our dependent variable. It depends on our independent variable. You got a time of 27.3 seconds with his runners. We reset him back to the start. We put his casual shoes on. We start the timer. He runs the 100 meters. And this time, he got a time of 30.2 seconds. So a little bit slower this time. We take him back to the start. We put his boots on. We start the timer, he runs the 100 meters, we stop the timer, and this time he got a time of 33.3 seconds, which was his slowest time. So we can say that he runs the fastest with his runners, followed by his casual shoes, and then he runs the slowest in his boots. But that's not everything to this experiment, there's a few other things that we need to consider. The first thing to consider 
is the weather. We need to make sure that the weather was kept the same each time he ran the 100 meters. If it was sunny when he was wearing his runners, but if it was raining when he wore the other shoes, that's not really a fair comparison because the weather could have had an impact on his ability to run. The clothing that he was wearing is also something that we need to consider. We need to make sure that he was wearing the same clothes every time he ran this 100 meters. If he was wearing running gear, wearing his runners, he had to be wearing running gear for the other ones as well, otherwise his clothing could have affected his time. Same with the surface. If he was running on concrete or wood or grass, we need to make sure that that was the same every time he ran this 100 meters so that any difference in time was mainly just due to the shoes that he was wearing. That's what we're trying to achieve, an accurate and fair comparison between the types of shoes. Because these are the things that we're trying to control in this experiment, we call them controlled variables. And that's it for today's lesson. I hope you learned something. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. And I will see you next time. Okay, an interesting and kind of clear-cut way. We're not going to be concerning ourselves with control variables. We're going to be focusing on independent and dependent variables. A survey that goes out is a fairly simple and controlled model. We'll uh, presume that everyone was just paying attention without a lot of distractions when they were completing it for simplicity. So to take a look at the two types of variables here, independent variables, these are variables that are manipulated by the researcher. Uh, it means that the researcher is assigning people to the control group that gets no treatment and the researcher will also set people into the treatment group uh, if, if that's the, uh, the design uh, or the independent variable may be characteristics that are endemic within the individual that the researcher doesn't really control, like, say, gender. I don't change people's gender, but I can stratify groups by gender. I can say, let's assess the scores of how females respond to this, and then let's assess the scores of how males respond to this, and then we'll compare the two against each other. So it's either I as the researcher, I, as an independent, I'm making these group designations of who goes where and who gets treated with what, or I'm using some uh, attribute that's endemic within the participants to split them into two analytic groups. The dependent variable, if you're having trouble with the de uh, independent and the dependent variable, the biggest thing you can remember is the dependent variable is the outcome variable. This is what's being studied. Uh, and so this is the variable that's being tested by the research. And essentially, we're presuming that it may be impacted by the independent variable. So my research question could be along the lines, maybe I'm wondering, do females and males have the same academic achievement over the course of a semester? If I look at their two GPAs, uh, do the females have a higher or a lower GPA or are they about the same? So the IV is gender and the DV is, is their performance. Does that make sense? Questions there? Okay. Uh, so we could have a question like this. Let's, let's put this into action. Our research question could be, does self-care enhance end of the day energy level? So self-care is the independent variable that the researcher is going to uh, assign people to two groups, one that gets self-care one that doesn't get self-care. So that's the independent variable is self-care. Those who get it, those who don't. So for the control group, I'm gonna put in group one, my control group. These are people, I'm not gonna do anything to them. I'm just gonna assign them the group. You are in group one and we'll measure your end of the day energy level later. Then group two is gonna be my treatment group.
And self-care, I've operationalized, I've gone through the literature, I've gone through the theory, and I'm going to say these are the critical things that constitute self-care, and I've researched that these are the things, and here's how we provide these things. And so the people in the treatment group, are we're going to uh, coach them on getting appropriate rest, recreation, socialization, quality nutrition, and exercise. There's a lot going on for the people in group two. So this is my independent variable is self-care. And one group's getting it and the other group isn't. Now, my dependent variable is the outcome variable. Remember, the question I'm asking here is does self-care, the independent variable, enhance end-of-the-day energy level? my dependent variable. That's the outcome I want to look at. And I'm going to measure my dependent variable. What is your energy at the end of the day? Maybe it'll just be that question. And I will have them answer in a, uh, a simple scale, a one to five scale. One is I feel exhausted. Five is I feel energetic. So they have that continuum. So I've got my independent variable, my dependent variable. Here's another one that we were kind of talking about before. Does gender influence academic performance? Now, in this first one, I, as the researcher, assign people to this group or that group. But when it comes to gender, I don't have any control over people's gender. Ah, but I can stratify. I can split them into groups by gender, which I didn't create. So gender is a characteristic that is endemic. It's unchangeable attribute within the characteristic of the person. And I have females and I have males in my group, and I could split them off into those two groups. So there I am. And then my dependent variable is going to be their academic performance, their GPA. So I have my IV and my DV and when I run the statistics, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wind up with an average score for females, an average score for males, and the statistical test will tell me, did one outperform the other this way? Did females do better? Did males do better? Or did they do about the same? And then I'll get an answer to my research question. Questions on this for variable types. Okay, we'll be going over this and revisiting this at the point where we start getting into statistical processing, but this is the foundation of where we're going to be going. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the group work that I'd like to see you uh, do today. Here's a little bit of guidance. Uh, was it group one or group two that solidified their variable selections that finalize their two. Group one. Okay, so group one. Let me just make a note. And it's group two that decided on one pair of variables and is still working to identify the other pair. Is that correct? Okay, uh, so uh, for group one, uh, I'm going to recommend a slightly different task. Group two, uh, I, I think your highest priority is to identify that second pair of variables and keep in light the first pair that you selected. So you're not doing something that's consistent conceptually so similar and after we uh, have some breakout time uh, when you when you feel that you've landed on that second pair of variables uh, I'll ask for you to uh, call me into your group for some consultation so I could look over what you've come up with and uh, and verify that you you've got two good pairs of variables to go marching forward with uh, I, I want to make sure you're on good ground there uh, for the uh, group one, uh, you could begin your literature review uh, designations is who's going to uh, embark on what part of literature review for the variables that you've selected. So for instance, if your variables are Q4, uh, are you a part-time or full-time student? And Q33, uh, how many hours a week do you spend on schoolwork? Uh, and maybe your second pair of variables is what kind of a learner are you? And there's 
some categories there and how satisfied are you with the teaching style of your professors one to five, uh, you've got the basis for a literature review. And, uh, and as we talked about before, maybe you can find uh, for this pair of questions, maybe you can find something about a publication that addresses how many hours a week part-time and full-time students tend to spend on their schoolwork. If you can't find that article or that set of articles that speaks to both of those variables, maybe you can find separate articles, one that talks about what are the characteristics of students who select to be part or full-time students, and then maybe something along the lines of some publications that talk about how many hours a week students tend to spend on their schoolwork. So either they, they're they found together jointly in a publication or separately. Either way, you can gather the literature and begin uh, organizing that literature. Probably, I'm thinking, a couple or two or three papers uh, maybe two on each variable or until you feel certain that you have an understanding of those variables. It doesn't have to be pages and pages and pages of literature review. This is not a dissertation. It's a relatively compact project. And so what you could be looking at also is assignment two, which is going to be due on our seventh session. And uh, you have access to the syllabus that details what's going to happen and uh, a statement of the general problem that you're looking at. And that could be two pairs of problems per your variables, uh, the theoretical or conceptual framework you're going to be using for the study. My recommendation would be systems theory, but you'll still need to investigate systems theory and demonstrate how it applies to the questions that are being asked. And then, of course, construct the hypotheses and research question. So actually, this is out of order. The research question pertaining to the pair of questions and then the corresponding null and alternate hypotheses, and then identify and justify the research design that you're thinking of using, which is essentially survey research. Uh, that kind of answers itself as it pertains to these questions, if, if these are the questions. And then it goes on. Assignment two is building the variable chart. And if you want a preview of that, you're welcome to look at the PowerPoint for next week. Or if you want, wait until next week, and I will take you through each of these five attributes of the variable. And my goal by next week is that you can use your breakout time to construct that table. You will have what you need to proceed by next week to assemble the variable table in good, in good order. So uh, now that you know how to identify categorical and continuous variables, keep that in mind. Don't let that fall away. You're going to need that for the whole rest of the semester. Uh, good to know, and y'all did really well on our, on our uh, little game. Uh, so this is a sample of what the variable table is going to look like. And as I said, next week, we're going to go through this column by column with clear explanation of how to populate this table. And from this example, you may be able to, you know, uh, kind of wrap your head around where this is going uh, by now. Yes, question. Yes, I wanted to know, are we going to be using the discrete and continuous parts of the data, of the numerical data? So some of the variables are continuous and some are categorical, and it'll be your job to identify which are which. But I'm not going into the subdivisions of, mm -hmm. you know, is it ratio, interval, ordinal, nominal? We're not going there. Mm -hmm. If this was a more advanced statistics class, I would mention those. But even in the more advanced statistics class, the way I go after it is there's two kinds of variables. There's continuous variables. There's categorical variables. There's two subtypes of each, which I mentioned once, and then we get away from them. I have to mention them because it's part of the science, mm -hmm. but when it comes to making a statistical determination as to what am I gonna do, you need to know what the variables involve, bottom line, continuous or categorical, and you guys did great on that. And for this project, the assignment two, we're only doing numerical. 
Right. So if you look at the, the the last column here, level of measurement, I just like, just get it down to tell me if it's a continuous or categorical variable. And I will go through the definitions and how to populate each of these columns. We'll go through them column by column next week. This is a preview of coming attractions. And you see, I even put a blank row between them. So you can see this is pair one, this is pair two. And they're not going to cross that line. You're never going to be comparing the fourth variable here to the third, uh, second variable here. That's never going to happen. Okay. Does that answer what you were asking? Um, I think I'm actually a little bit more confused. My question was uh, for, for assignment two, we're only going to be working on the numerical variables. Uh, we're going to be working with uh, continuous numerical variables. We'll also be coping with categorical variables. Mm -hmm. so, so, for instance, here, are you a part-time or full-time student? What kind of variable is that? That's categorical. It's a categorical variable. And here, question 33, how many hours a week do you spend on schoolwork? Is that continuous or categorical? Continuous. It's continuous, exactly. Now, knowing those enables you, when the time comes, I will show you how knowing what kinds of variables you have on hand will direct you to the right statistic. For instance, if you have two continuous categoricals, that takes you down a correlation pathway. If you have a categorical and a continuous variable, that's going to be a t-test if it's two categories, like part-time, full-time. But if it's something like this, where there's more than two categories paired with a continuous, that means you're going to go for ANOVA. We'll talk about this when we get there. Another possibility is that you could have two categorical variables. And you want to analyze that, that would take you down the chi-square road. And I know I'm mentioning stuff that we haven't gotten to yet, but this is the relevancy of identifying what kinds of variables do you have, continuous or categorical, because that's going to carve the pathway to selecting an appropriate statistical analysis. And from my perspective, knowing which statistic to reach for is half the battle. Once you're on the right track, the rest is pretty clear. So, uh, I mean, to, to answer your question, are you only going to be dealing with continuous variables? It's like, I can't say the answer to that is yes, unless you happen to select variables that are all continuous. But you can do some fascinating calculations with a t-test, a part-time, full-time, and then asking how many students, how many uh, uh, hours a week do you work as a student? Uh, just a little preview of coming attraction. So that would be solved with a t-test. And what's going to happen, what the computer would do is it will get an average hours. Uh, it'll look at this variable. How many hours a week do you spend on schoolwork? It's going to gather and calculate an average for the full-time students. And then it's going to gather an average for the part-time students. And then it's going to compare those two averages. And it'll either tell you they're no statistically significant difference, meaning they're both about the same, or it's going to say there is a statistically significant difference. This group is significantly higher than that group. Does that make sense? Okay. And we'll get there when we get there. Don't fuss about that now. But what I'm saying is whatever pairs of variables you're coming up with, categoricals, continuous or a mix of the two, we have a statistic that'll solve that. And so this is the time to identify what you have. And this is part of the value of this table is nailing down in, in this last column, is this a continuous or categorical? This will be critical for reviewing by the time it's time to start processing statistics. So questions, uh, any further questions about any of this? Okay, so this week uh, for group one, you've uh, identified your two variables. Uh, this would be an opportune time to talk about who's going to do literature review on which variables. 
Uh, you might want to do something like that. I would say hold off on building the table because I'm going to give step-by-step tutorial on that next week. And I think it'll just be a more graceful and less editing if you can hold off until next week. Uh, so that might be a good task for group one to do. Group two uh, need to talk about the pair that you've already selected. And I'm advising you to uh, come up with a consensus of what you think that second pair will be. And then please summon me in so that I can review what you've come up with and uh, maybe hear about some other variables that you've, uh, that you've considered uh, as, as plan B. So everyone clear on, uh, I mean, you can use your group time any way you want. I just want to provide you with my best recommendations on, on how to be uh, productive to all of this. Should we also be looking at the oh. first part of assignment two that are the first, it's the four questions, right? It's like, what's the general problem? What's the theoretical framework? Um, should we be looking at that, Absolutely. but not the table? Okay. Absolutely. What? Yeah, I'd say stay away from the table this week. I'm going to give you a very thorough run through on the table and it'll make a great uh, breakout session for next time. So use the time to do. I mean, I'm not going to micromanage your project. I could just best advise you on uh, keeping on track to what the next step of what's due is for assignments two and three. But you have the syllabus in front of you and you're intelligent people. You can use your time wisely. Uh, my biggest thought, though, group two really needs to nail down that second very variable today. Uh, again, we talked about this either addressing your pairs of variables in the literature review singularly or bringing them together into uh, one query uh, jointly. Uh, I think we talked about this last week is either answer, do the research on question four and then do separate research on question two. But I think first, see if there's something that addresses them jointly. What's known about the number of class hours worked for full-time and part-time students? If you can find a couple of papers on that, that's, that's, more, that's preferable to uh, separating them out. But if that's not showing up, you can always split them into two separate literature searches. So no frustration there. Same thing with the second pair of questions. Uh, and then, of course, there's details on assignment three, which is slightly down the road, uh, specifying how the literature review is to be structured. And if you have questions on that, I'll be glad to help you with that. Uh, and of course, a conclusion that goes with all this. Uh, there's the link to the online library, which you can get to with no trouble at all. And Wendy Korsakoff is a gem of a research. I've met with her on Zoom. She is friendly and enthusiastic, and I had to hold her back with both hands from visiting the class. Uh, she's just so enthusiastic. And I said, you know, how about if they reach you, if they need you? Uh, and of course, this is uh, what you get. Well, the graphics change all the time. They keep it interesting, but there's the URL for reaching the library homepage, which will bring you to something like this, uh, which you'll populate with your search terms. And of course, there's the help menus over here and you can choose what you want to find. I think uh, the why you find is a great uh, resource that takes you into all kinds of good places. Here's your search term. And there's a few things you can do. You can click on get full text will take you to PDFs. At some point, if you're not already logged in, it'll ask you to log in uh, to get the security on that. And over here, you can choose, I want peer reviewed and that'll trim the list down. And you can also choose the year. So maybe instead of reaching back to 1832 on this, maybe you'd set this to something like uh, 2000 or 2010 or something. And, uh, and they, sometimes you'll get a login prompt if you're not already logged in. Uh, a couple other tips on searching is you can use Boolean search terms, which is basically the and and or conjunction. So if you want to see a paper that has depression and the word seniors and the word treatment in it, just throw the word and in between those terms. Another way you can go, if you really want depressed seniors, you can make sure that these two words travel with depressed followed by seniors by wrapping quotes around them. And then you can use some Boolean and and treatment. So you don't want to just see depressed and seniors because that might be uh, depressed 
uh, seniors in high school, but maybe we mean depressed and geriatric or depressed and elderly or depressed seniors. So uh, you have a lot of latitude with those search terms. Uh, so we talked about my recommendations for what each group should be doing. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the breakout room. Hang on just a second. Let me find where that is. Oh, there's I just have one rooms. question and, about um, assignment one. Do you want it in essay format or we could answer the question like as is? Yeah. So for assignment one, best to use bold section headers and just that'll help keep you organized. And it'll also help me in seeing that you've addressed each part of the 10 point outline. And it makes the grading and evaluation more evenly spread than trying to read through a big block of text and say, did they address this? Did they address that? So help me help you. And also I think it'll lay a structure in line and please upload P, uh, uh, DOC or DOCX file. Please don't submit a, a PDF file. It's harder to, for me to uh, put comments and edits in. And that's due any time today. Okay. Uh, anything else on that? Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and create the two breakout rooms. And just for convenience, y'all know which group number you're in. Just put yourself in the correct breakout room. And I'll ask, once again, group 